يا بودبورة وشورت وكاب ومباحث تنفيذ واداب استجواب بكلاب وعذاب روح اخبط راسك في الباب يا بودبورة وشورت وكاب ومباحث تنفيذ واداب استجواب بكلاب وعذاب روح اخبط راسك في الباب هتعيط يا اختي يا مسكين خدوا ده fortunate today to have a very exciting and com incredibly productive scholar uh, who's been a significant figure in Middle Eastern studies but also in comparative studies working on Brazil and Latin America for some time now. He is Paul Amar. He's an associate professor in the Global and International Studies program at one of our sister institutions here in California. We're starting to work through its faculty. University of California, Santa Barbara. And you'll know how interdisciplinary he is if I tell you all the other affiliated appointments he has at UC Santa Barbara in feminist studies, in sociology, in comparative literature, in Middle Eastern studies, and in Latin American and Iberian studies. So Paul, I hope you don't have to go to all those faculty meetings. <laughs> um, but at UC Santa Barbara, he currently serves as chair of Middle East studies coordinator of the Campus Cluster on Security Studies and a member of the Graduate Studies Council. In addition, he serves as coordinator of scholarly projects for the Arab Council of the Social Sciences, which is based in Beirut. Before he began his academic career, um, he had another career working as a journalist and then as a police reformer in Brazil, which is, I guess, how, how you got the foundation of comparative interest in your work and as a conflict resolution and economic development specialist at the United Nations. And he continues to be active in working with non-governmental organizations and foundations, including an association he had with the Ford Foundation project on police, sec uh, police reform and security sector reform, and as a chair of the advisory board for youth of the Open Society Foundation. But in addition to all that, he's a prolific author. Uh, Hisham somehow managed to get a hold of uh, uh, a number of the books he's produced. And they include Cairo Cosmopolitan in 2006, New Racial Missions of Policing in 2010, Global South to the Rescue in 2011, Dispatches from the Arab Spring in 2013, the Middle East and Brazil in 2014, and also uh, in 2014, <clears throat> the book that uh, serves as the basis for his presentation today, The Security Archipelago, Human Security States, Sexuality Politics, and the End of Neoliberalism. And finally, Paul, we congratulate you on this book winning the Charles Taylor Award for Best Book of the Year by the Interpretive Methods section of the American Political Science Association. So thanks uh, for coming up from UC Santa Barbara. Thank you. So thanks for the very nice uh, welcome and the great introduction. And I'm swimming in the good smells of all this food, so um, <laughs> it's I'm almost high on it. So it uh, sounds great. If I were eating with you, I would immediately pass out for a siesta halfway through the talk. So um, feel free to do so if you need to. I won't take it personally. So my copies of the books are being circulated around. Feel free to take a look at that. And we can talk about those after the session if there's a specific interest we want to explore more there. So um, today is going to be fun, maybe sometimes a little disjointed, uh, but uh, a, a very thorough um, uh, exploration of uh, a set of case studies that appears in my book, The Security Archipelago. Sometimes when I speak, I'm asked to speak just about the Egypt dimensions, sometimes just about the military reform dimensions, sometimes just about the gender and sexuality dimensions. But I've been asked to do a little bit of everything, which is nice for me. It's a challenge, but I enjoy it. So uh, this will not be a overly um, uh, a real refined and organized lecture today, but it'll give everyone a glimpse of the case studies that I look at. It'll, I'll, I'll introduce my overarching arguments, and then I'll try to save time for discussion afterwards because I know many of you come from uh, a, a variety of backgrounds and will want to explore specific parts of this project um, on your own terms, and I welcome that. So the book is called The Security Archipelago, and this metaphor of the archipelago 
I developed as an alternative to choosing rather a local approach, focusing on the specificity of culture and institutional change in one location, or a global approach looking at geopolitics and larger shifts within the political economic or the neoliberal systems um, overarching these countries. Instead, the archipelago in, is, is meant to invite us to explore these island chains of laboratories in which security and policing practices are tested and developed, particularly in these semi-peripheral zones of the global south, these zones in which you have very visible, um, very important conflicts around um, policing of dissidents, around policing of informal economies and trafficking activities that um, are very visible to security actors at the global level and how they're resolved and the models that are developed therein are often leap um, to the global level and become uh, models that the whole world ends up uh, following. So I choose the metaphor of the archipelago in order to kind of move between these, this island chain of project sites and to follow these laboratories of security practices, particularly how they clash with movements around gender and sexuality rights and with movements around right-wing forms of moralization and social purification. So I'm looking at security models, I'm looking at social movements, and I'm looking at this notion of dissemination of security norms from this island chain or archipelago of hotspots towards global regimes of security and, um, uh, and, and social control. So the particular set of phenomena I'm looking at uh, are the shift in norms and practices of security, particularly from the 1990s to today, but accelerating in terms of um, their pace of change and increasing in terms of their global visibility in just the last few years between 2011 and 2014. I'm looking in particular at this, at this formula that was articulated and came to be um, very visible in this period in which we have a crisis of social polarization and ex acceleration of social movement clashes with elements of the security state, demanding that the state address increasing social and economic inequalities, increasing levels of violence against both um, uh, marginalized urban populations as well against, as, as against women and sexual minorities, as an eruption of a new wave of social movements demanding that this kind of polarization be addressed by the state, and in which the state increasingly with alliance with another set of social movements that are organized around figures of moralization and social purification, the state then says, all right, we are going to deal radically with these questions of social polarization, but we're going to reframe them as a crisis in faith of cultural authenticity and of moral stability. So we're going to take this, these questions generated by social movements, we're going to frame them in terms of a, a crisis of cultural authenticity and moral viabil viability, and then we're going to solve them not through economic redistribution, not through new models of social inclusion, but through the deployment of what I call human security, what I do by appropriating the term human security, a, a new kind of humanitarian, um, humanized form of security operation that will try to solve these problems of social polarization, of social polarization through a mix of um, a moral and faith-based intervention infused through and within military and policing interventions. So we, lead, so we have the appropriation of a social model of critique and protest by a moral and um, highly narrow version of a cultural rescue agenda to be implemented not through economic inclusion policies in these cases, but through policing and military models. So I'm looking particularly at the case of Brazil and Egypt, two polities that have had long-term military <coughs> governments, that have had long histories of social struggles around police involvement in, um, in both informal economies and in constant um, coercive occupations of public space and social spheres. But I'm looking at this period in which we have from the 90s and accelerating in recent years and a reframing of these police and military practices as humanitarian, what they, as they identify themselves, humanitarian interventions in the domestic sphere, but in which that humanitarian intervention, these coercive rescue uh, missions within the domestic sphere are framed within new logics of moral and cultural rescue. Moral and rescue of a kind of authentic moral code that the nation has strayed from and rescue of a kind of cultural essence 
that the nation has been uh, seen as threatened by global processes of change the past year. So the pictures I show here, past year, the picture I show here is, for example, a Brazilian soldier from actually the Navy riding a tank through um, a favela slum in Rio de Janeiro. These soldiers had actually been involved in quote unquote humanitarian peacekeeping missions in Haiti, which had actually enforced the coup against the elected president Aristide. Um, so these same humanitarian forces in Brazil then became redeployed as part of this attempt to, as I discussed in the book, to rescue um, black culture and rescue Afro-Brazilian um, inhabited favelas from a kind of uh, uh, cultural degradation, as they would frame it, and a kind of moral hazard that had been um, that had uh, uh, infected the favela because of its in insertion within narco-trafficking frameworks. So again, this kind of an international military frame for intervening in crisis regions like Haiti becomes domesticated as a regularized social control response within the daily life of the city, justified not just because of, of a notion of conflict, but because of a notion of moral and cultural um, degradation that required a military response. In Egypt, as we know, we've had um, several rounds now alternating between police and military intervention in a, in a time of social unrest and uprising, in which we have uh, the military adopting uh, several different increasingly intensive versions of this moral rescue discourse to justify their intervention. First, against the police and in favor of some of the social movement actors of 2011, eventually against um, those same social movement actors, as well as against the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups, by trying to one-up the Islamists by adopting a more moral than thou kind of project of rescuing the state from the threat of uh, moral degradation and cultural impurity. So I want to look at these kind of morality dimensions and cultural dimensions of these highly in intensive forms of military and police occupation through this process. So what I've been looking, so let's step back a little bit into history to look at some of the changes that have happened in the military um, forces, specifically in Brazil and Egypt. So you can see some of the vectors through which I look at political change in a comparative light here. So in, as we, we all know, in the 1960s and 70s and until 1985, Brazil was ruled by a military dictatorship. Military dictatorship, which was mixed in terms of its social and economic policies. At some phases, it implemented um, very neoclassical and neoliberal forms of adjustment. In other times, it had a more populist, socially inclusive set of policies. But in any case, by 1985, we had very strong social movement responses, a juridical culture and ascendance. We had um, uh, a labor movement return to um, uh, organizing in the Northeast and in the South. Eventually, the military was pushed from power, but did not disappear. The military was redeployed in two main ways, around building infrastructure projects, in the Amazon in particular, to develop that uh, frontier zone, and also around the world as humanitarian missions. Remember in, um, in, uh, in Indonesia, around Timor, in Africa, in Afghanistan, and most spectacularly in Haiti and in Angola. We have the military then, this, often the same generals that have been attached to the military dictatorship in Brazil were kind of uh, eased out of power by giving them these juicy jobs, either as building infrastructure projects in the Amazon or out in the world in these humanitarian missions. So now that we see those same humanitarianized, quote unquote, military leaders and soldiers, that were the same folks from the dictatorship uh, and the same training practices and logics come back in now to occupy the favelas during the World Cup and the Olympics, we, it's, it's, it's not within, uh, you know, it's, it should be within our um, historical imagination to ask ourselves, are we risking the return of dictatorship now that we've given them a reason to come back into the country? But anyway, in Egypt actually had a similar set of processes during the same period. The military has never left um, the governing power in Egypt in any full sense, but during the same period uh, of later Mubarak period, there was an attempt uh, to remove the military from direct uh, 
uh, from, its, from its leverage within the higher uh, entities of the state. And one way they did that was, again, the military then was offered a bargain in the late Sadat period and, and then several times in the Mubarak period that if the, if the military would leave the civil sphere of the state and focus on developing infrastructure projects in the desert, tourist cities on the, on the beaches, malls and shopping malls and peripheries of Cairo, um, and new and eventually the second branch of the Nile boondoggle project, Toshka, which would send water evaporating into the desert, or a new branch of the Suez Canal. These projects would incur a lot of wealth for the leaders of the military, would keep them busy, would try to keep them out of the civil sphere. Also, the Egyptian military was sent to Bosnia, and in the, Egypt in the Egyptian military's history, they consider themselves the humanitarian victors of the Bosnian conflict because they, in the Egyptian military history, they credit themselves for saving um, uh, Sarajevo from complete destruction by the Serbian militias. So similarly, they have this mix of a move from being a kind of military dictatorship model to, being, to focusing on rescuing humanitarian victims, protecting them from uh, uh, assault um, in these conflict situations, or and moving into these mega projects where they developed huge infrastructure for new developmental schemes or for new tourism and, and leisure um, activities. So again, there no, should be no surprise when we see now in just the last year the Brazilian military getting heavily involved in building soccer stadiums, and policing soccer stadiums. The Egyptian military is building soccer stadiums and policing soccer stadiums, building new canals, bridges, roads. So this is a global trend, not happening in every military, but that is part of this, infra this, this social infrastructure and this political economic um, formation of militarism that we're seeing pop up, whether it's in Thailand, Pakistan, countries throughout Africa. Militaries have new roles. Now that humanitarian law has banned aggressive war, so that that can't be necessarily their number one role, they've invented themselves as a new role as cores of infrastructure developers and rescue agencies. At the same time, we have seen policing <coughs> converge from another side towards some similar, towards at least that humanitarian rescue dimension of institutional <coughs> norms and practices. Police have increasingly, as just as the military, uh, in attempts to civilianize the military, <coughs> meaning to decommission them from having state authority, at least the, the, the military has moved to civilianize themselves through infrastructure and projects or to humanitarianize themselves. Police have moved away from that civilian posture and towards militarization. So in a sense, we've had police occupy the military role of the military increasingly, while the military occupies a kind of developmentalist and humanitarian role. So we've had a displacement, but not a um, dismantlement of processes of militarization. So we've had in Brazil and Egypt police, entire new police forces <coughs> created that are mili paramilitary security units. The Polícia Militar in Brazil, of course, has been around since the days of slavery, when they were basically slave catchers and rangers for private militia groups. But since the 1980s, the Police Militar have been huge paramilitary forces that are, conduct basically combat and assault and occupation operations, working for usually the landowning elites and for um, the governors of the states, but with very little accountability. But this process of de-civilianizing the police, meaning shifting more resources towards the military functions of the Police Militar, and increasingly towards new forms of militarized police which, are, which have an increasingly humanitarian identity but which actually have a much more uh, deep connection with the military itself like the new pacification forces in, that are preparing for the Olympics. We've had this move from towards a more humanitarian justification whether it's the awful violent police militar but that justify themselves as a kind of rescue campaign to save the Afro-Brazilian identities from the corruptions of narco-traffic, or the new pacification forces that are aligned with, often with the military that are to pacify the community that wear these blue hats, literally in, in reminiscence of United Nations pacification missions, and but are adopting more of a, a military footing. 
So in Egypt during the same period, we had, since 1986, we've had the rapid expansion of Amna Merkazi paramilitary uh, security forces. We've had the expansion of wave after wave of um, the Interior Ministry's police forces with special operations functions, more militarized assault functions. And we've also had the proliferation of private security companies, basically mercenary thug militias that work for particular landowners, land developers, infrastructure projects that, again, have an explicitly military posture, although they're non-uniformed. But even those, even those most sluggish elements tend to justify themselves, as I'll discuss, through these kind of humanitarian logics of intervention. All right, so um, we see this kind of humanization, again, this kind of dark appropriation of the logic of humanization, humanitarianism, meaning that this idea that these increasingly expand this expansion of, of police and military intervention in the domestic and civil sphere is justified through a logic of rescue and of humanitarian emergency intervention. Um, now, for those of those interested, maybe later on we can talk about why I see this as requiring a different analytical lens than the critique of neoliberalism, the critique of liberalization, because I think this securitization <laughs> dynamic is very different from what we think of as a, in terms of a liberalization dynamic. This is not about civil society and civilianization. This is about the securitization and an occupation of the civil sphere by militar militarized entities. So again, this has emerged during a, uh, a set of um, parallel practices that have um, reinforced and made um, uh, the norms of these practices um, circulate more widely, this, the discussions around human security, the, of course, expansion of humanitarian actors coming from the global south, like Brazil, and Nigeria, India, etc., who have taken up this humanitarian logic in order to, as I argue, extend the power of these post-dictatorship militaries rather than transform and redeem them as they appear. Um, and also other aspects like different kinds of community policing, which sound good on the surface, but have actually been married to a new excuse to expand militarization processes at the local level. So now let me um, focus on a couple case studies. Um, let's see, look at the time, make sure I'm not going to get too off track here. So don't try to read all this text. I left some of this on there for my own sake, so I don't have to read from a paper or notes. So you can just look at the, of course, overly sexualized images of these <laughs> campaigns taken from the Brazilian state media. Um, so one of the cases I want I look at in the book are the mix of evangelical Pentecostal um, activist movements allying themselves with the militarized units of the military police in Rio and their attempts to purge Rio de Janeiro of what they call sex trafficking and child sexual slavery in the early 2000s, which has been repeated in almost exactly the same way just before the World Cup last year. As a matter of fact, a lot of, I went down there and was, was presenting this particular chapter again and again and again last year in Rio. So what we had here was a really interesting case of after an era of for a few years in which the, the brutality, and particularly the sexually, sexual brutality of the military police had been thoroughly critiqued and exposed by this new wave of civil society movements, feminist movements, gay and lesbian movements, the Movimento Negro, the black movement critiquing police racist brutality, had peaked. When I arrived in Brazil in 1999, it was on the upswing. We had a, a fantastic um, uh, a, a state security um, minister in Rio de Janeiro who was from the activist civil society movements, Luis Flávio Suárez. We had a governor. Benedito da Silva in the, this period, who had come from black movements in the favela and was a Pentecostal Christian, but also identified with feminist movements in the era. And the police were really on the defensive. There had been the governor, who was very pro-police, um, was about to be um, charged with um, uh, racketeering and with gun running and, and, and arms smuggling with the police. So the police were very much on the defensive. There was a strong moral critique coming from both the Catholic Church and from many aspects of the evangelical church. And so 
uh, right-wing elements within the evangelical movement allied with the defensive members of the military police and decided, well, how can we redeem these police forces that are now defending their legitimacy and trying to stop what had become finally talked about in the public sphere, which was the dismantlement, the complete banishing of the military police and their supplanting with an entirely new civil police structure. Now that, that conversation had begun. So what we had um, was that this, again, the success of resistance, getting to the point of being able to imagine Brazil without the military police, seeing the state itself, the governor, and the, and the interior ministry apparatus, security ministry apparatus, as being completely infiltrated by racketeers that were very close to these banda podres, these racketeering rackets that were basically part of the narco-trafficker cartels. And we had started to critique the racial and sexual violence, the assaults and rapes committed by police officers. So what does the police do? The police looks for a new way to portray itself as a humanitarian mission rather than as in a, this kind of corrupt enforcement operation. So they ally themselves with um, international evangelical anti-sex trafficking activists, and the police, on their own accord, decide to generate a whole set of interventions in which they will focus on uh, purging Rio de Janeiro of its child sex slaves in the, the way they created in, dis in their own discourse is how they identify this problem. So the abolish and abolish abolition of child sex slavery becomes the mission at the core of what is called Operation Princess, a series of mobilizations in Rio de Janeiro in order to rescue these princesses from sexual slavery, but also very much tied within this campaign to create a new humanitarian, gender-sensitive mission for the police in order to save them from being basically dismantled and give them a new mission that's appropriate to the 21st century Lula era of in um, which Brazil is going to change its reputation from a disreputable sex tourism destination to becoming a new humanitarian superpower in the language of Lula. So the nationals versus a local transformation happening here. So why does this call Operation Princess? Why does this end up revealing some incredible contradictions? And why does this operation end up failing in the end to establish a new humanitarian um, identity for the police? Well, for one thing, it's called Operation Princess because it begins in Copacabana in the area around um, Avenida Princesa Isabel. It, Avenue Prince, it's Princess Isabel is named after the, um, the emperor, basically, of Brazil, the last emperor of Brazil, Princess Isabel, who was the one that signed the abolition of slavery finally in 1888. And so that magic pen in which she signed the abolition of slavery has become then a symbol of the new um, evangelical discourse that wants to abolish prostitution, that wants to dismantle Brazil's carnival culture, dismantle Brazil's sex work industry, and is working with the police in order to implement this agenda. So, um, so we have this discourse of abolition, figure of Princess Isabel, now, we have a long history in the black movement of critiquing this focus on Princess Isabel, who is who's often portrayed as this young, virginal woman, but was actually kind of like a Queen Victoria figure. She was an, you know, an older woman when she did this. She was not a member of any social movements. She was not a member of um, these feminist movements. And the critique of this kind of identity of the, um, uh, the state from the top down uh, abolishing slavery, which ignores the social movements on the ground, the movements of, of the uh, uh, black post-slaves in Brazil that pushed for abolition, is kind of reveals a bit of the, of the gendered and race logic that was at the core of Operation Princess. It identified itself as a kind of external, top-down um, rescue movement, um, rather than as connected with the social movements within the urban sector itself. So finally, by focus and then fo by focusing on children, that meant that it didn't have to engage the women's movements themselves, the women's sex worker rights movement, the even the women's feminist evangelical movements themselves. It could just by focusing on children, it could be police directly speaking to those that couldn't speak on their own terms, directly ignoring questions of agency and participation in these campaigns and in setting the terms. So, but and and in trying to make the police 
look unquestionably as rescuers, and the child, of course, unquestionably represented as a victim who couldn't speak on their own terms. So anyway, so I can't go into too much detail about each of these cases, but what ended up um, happening, let's see if I have the, so what was interesting is that in this case, we had a very active civil society, very active set of social movements that was able to dismantle this rescue agenda, that was able to find the weaknesses in this mix of a revived, highly militarized and corrupt police in Militar with a very top-down um, moral agenda of evangelical social movements. So three or four things happened that enabled for this um, military, militarized rescue agenda to be critiqued. One thing is that we had the actual surveillance media itself, or this kind of like tabloid media itself, that was constantly chasing the police around, trying to get great shots of them rescuing these girl sex slaves. They were obsessed with it. They kept catching the police themselves, um, basically pimping adult women, capturing adult women, and then taking, forcing them to give money to the police in order to to work again, and they showed got lots of shots of police delivering, delivering food and pizzas to the women that were working for them on the street. And so they kept catching the police, creating sex trafficking rackets rather than rescuing children, and often abusing and harassing and assaulting adult women <coughs> in when they're being given this blank check to rescue children, sex slaves. So this, in this case, the tabloid, you know, the kind of Fox type media in Brazil because they were so obsessed with capturing this heroic campaign to rescue sex slaves, ended up revealing these, um, the, the police doing exactly the opposite. But, uh, secondly, we had the mobilization of um, these kind of workers' groups, these groups that I talk about as having a, you know, a workerist logic of security, which is trying to get the police out of the security business and to return the state, the Brazilian state, towards a social security logic based upon empowering, including women in the sex work sector, to have workers' cards, to have full health care access, to have university education access. So this social logic of security was specifically posed as a way to solve this problem of sex, quote unquote, sex slavery, or to solve the problems of, of um, gender violence within the sex work sector. And this actually got a lot of visibility because of the fetishization of the Operation Princess raids. So members of these kind of workerist groups that wanted to return to a worker-focused model of how to empower people in the sex work sector began to actually make some traction. A Green Party candidate associated who had kind of been um, disaffected with the Workers' Party actually took on this agenda of a workerist approach towards sex trafficking and made it this close to becoming mayor of Rio. Um, and finally, we had this kind of um, Bush ex machina thing. This is during the George Bush II era. George Bush got involved in Operation Princess and insisted that all AIDS um, funding from the United States that was involved in the support for the government's AIDS treatment program be pulled out of anything that could be seen as associated with empowerment of sex workers or prostitutes or people in the sex tourism economy in Brazil. And that backlash because seeing the United States as getting involved in this campaign produced a backlash where even the, the evangelical feminists and one of the Catholic feminists that wrote the trafficking legislation upon Operation, with which Operation Princess was based, they recanted their support for these laws and they joined with the social movements, the um, workers' movements, and the feminist movements to shift back towards a demand that the police and military be dis dismantled and that a workers' rights model be used for the issues of sex work. So as this case demonstrates and as each case in my book shows, that we have this incredibly powerful and violent model that mixes moral rescue, social purification, and increasing military and, and, pol and police involvement in daily life. But its contradictions are always um, uh, it always is uh, rife with contradictions and social movements, if they're aware of the securitization process, the way that morality and security discourse are married together, can unpack it, can cause these security practices to fall apart, and they can ar articulate an alternative. So I won't go through the... In the book, I define the different contradictions within these campaigns and how 
Even in each case in my book, I show how social movements can probe those contradictions, can find where they're most likely to be um, the crisis generated, and it can intervene and offer a re, a more progressive and socially conscious um, uh, framing of the same problems. So I want to make sure we get to a couple cases in Egypt. Um, so this is a similar, uh, looking here at the conflicts around uh, cultural rescue, the rescue of, of quote-unquote Islamic values and Egyptian social family values in Egypt in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Again, around a zone identified with cabaret tourism and underworld kind of um, uh, economies in Egypt on Pyramids Road and on the Nile waterfront. Again, we're looking at this in a time in the late 90s and early 2000s in which we again had um, a very strong moment of uh, critique of uh, police violence in these areas. There had started to be a set of, in starting in the late 80s, but increasing in the late 90s, started to have a return to a critique of police violence in these areas. We had started to have social movements for the first time um, in many years, uh, demanding a thorough reform of the interior ministry. We had riots in and around the um, paramilitary on the Merkazi, the security, um, central security forces in these areas. And so we again had a time in which the police forces, again Mubarak's um, attempt to trans first attempts to transfer power toward a group of businessmen around his son were met with strong resistance during this time by social movement actors. The police deployed against them were, were met with uh, direct response on the ground. So again, we have this moment in which uh, the security state model of governance ha could either be overthrown by a new coalition of social actors on the ground, mix of liberal student and labor groups, or else move in another direction in which that security state model is going to intensify itself and make itself even more rigid and coercive, but legitimizing itself through this moral humanitarian security framework. So we've had this contest going on then since the late 90s in Egypt. So this case here, when I look at the Pyramids Road case, I again focus on certain controversies which are often understood by Western um, social scientists or even by activists as a conflict between Eastern and Western values, between local culture and globalization. And often we have, for example, in, in the case of the Queen Boat Raid in 2000 when we had um, a group of men ra uh, uh, arrested and labeled as gay for being in a uh, nightclub on the Nile. And this became a long debate, which still goes on to this day, over which sh should human rights groups and civil society organizations defend the rights of a local culture to protect itself from the influence of Western values and globalization, or should we favor the universal human rights of all groups and enforce a kind of liberal human rights regime in all regions. But in fact, if you look at what happened in this Queen Boat raid where these guys were picked up, or in the various raids that were happening at the same time and that no one ties in, mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of raids arresting women sex workers, arresting women uh, club owners, arrest, arresting and eventually dispossessing the entire um, the property of an entire class of women cabaret entrepreneurs that have been building clubs in this area since the 1950s and who are the, the heirs of the women that built the original um, cabaret zone in central Cairo before that. So this era, we also had a raid and arrest and the dispossession of properties from this entire class of women capitalists that had built an entire zone of cabarets and nightclubs and even film um, production facilities were also being arrested, were also having their, their property taken, were also being humiliated but charged as prostitutes. So for some reason that completely political manufacture of a prostitution charge no one cared about internationally, whereas basically the arrest of these same men in a similar type raid then became an international uh, controversy because of the way this lens of East versus West, particularly around questions of homosexuality, was fetishized. But I want to reinsert that raid, not to make it any less awful, into this 
this attempt by the police to begin to implement a new kind of highly gendered, highly moralized discourse of rescuing, in this case, women entrepreneurs and you know, sexually, sexual minority men, whatever we care to call them, from this kind of um, uh, threat of globalization. But what was really happening on the ground is these police forces are trying to restore the legitimacy during a time in which anti-police um, and reform movements are growing very strong, and in which these same areas right around the Nile and on Pyramids Road are also becoming very desirable for new investors from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. This is a time in which Saudi Arabia and Kuwait becomes very aggressive about appro appropriating the spaces of the Nile and the, and, the, and the traditional kind of tourist corridor between the pyramids and the Nile. And eventually, Saudi Arabia and Kuwaiti investors manage to develop a very strong relationship with the local police and protection rackets in this area that manage to, dis that manage to clean out many of the Egyptian um, owners from these areas or else develop a forced kind of relationship of subservience to these new forms of Gulf capital. And this basically eliminates what was a set, this zone had been particularly associated with women's capital and women's successful development. Queen Boat was owned by a woman. The clubs closed on Pyramids Road. Almost all of them are owned by Egyptian women. So we had a shift towards the Gulf from Egyptian capital. We had the destru destruction, which, which happened also after 2011, of a whole economy of nightlife owned and controlled by women Paradoxically, this was done in order to rescue women from the threats, the moral hazards of globalization, right? And to rescue new young men who are actually enjoying these zones from, again, this kind of notion that their culture and identity was being, um, was being perverted, and that used term always being used, perverted by globalization. So this is another example in which we had a discourse of rescue, a discourse of cultural resuscitation or, or rescue being imposed over something that's very different. A set of processes that was not about local versus global culture. It was a process of a shift towards um, Saudi and Kuwaiti capital in this case, a shift towards new military developments of, of leisure zones in alliance with Saudi capital, and very much a gendered process of sexual repression and a kind of extermination of a women's economy in center city, which is, the, in my view, the real story of what was going on at these times. So again, there's, there's, there is a model that makes it very easy. And unfortunately, the model of the moral rescue and the cultural uh, purification model often resonates with a lot of progressive activists. And they get swept up in that model. And they take it on as their agenda. They want to stop sex trafficking. Who doesn't want to stop sex trafficking if it really exists in the way that the police tell us? Who, want, who doesn't want to preserve the unique cultures of Egypt or of the Arab world. We're all behind that. But what it's done is it's used to actually extend police and military intervention and to mask new forms of capital, particularly these kind of crony forms of capital coming from the Gulf or new oil developers. And often, as in Brazil or in here, it actually uh, is a direct attack against women's autonomy in the economy and of the ability for them to control public space and economic development. So. Um, so I go on in, in other chapters to talk about, for example, this is the, the prehistory of the pacification forces in Rio and how it takes up these agendas of cultural rescue of Afro-Brazilian culture. And again, this discourse of, well, we need hardcore police to save the black populations from their own cultural degradation. Again, we have this rescue logic. This time it's not about saving women from trafficking, it's about saving black youth from their own cultural degradation, right? From their own insertion into traffickers, form trafficker globalization, as it's sometimes called, or shadow globalization, or parallel globalization. We had attempts by Benedita, and I worked in uh, the margins of her government in 1990, in, in 2002, um, in attempts to displace this notion of we have to have uh, police, uh, militarized police implement our um, racial justice policies, and she struggled very hard to change that into a more workers' empowerment model with women in the lead rather than <coughs> male assault forces in the lead. But she was basically overthrown by a coup from the police and in prison riots that were orchestrated by 
an alliance between the police and the narco-trafficker gangs. So that's a fascinating story worth worth talking about on its own, but it's a story of how there is an, there are amazing social movements that do manage to reveal these contradictions and connect the dots between the humanitarian model of rescue and the attempts by police to maintain their corrupt and particularly masculinized rule. But the stakes are high. You know, there's, there's whether it's the coup in Egypt or whether it's the coups in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro that happen every day, the stakes are very high. So I go into that de in detail. Uh, this is complicated, it takes a long time to explain, but uh, it's, this is a, the, the case of a similar case in which we had um, urban redevelopment actors acting of an alliance with the Interior Ministry to socially cleanse a particular very popular, densely populated uh, slum area now in Cairo, Balmea, which was identified for a long time with the urban drug and sex economy. Um, Balnea uh, was going to be transformed into an open-air Islamic architecture museum because of its fantastic architecture from the Fatimid and the Mamluk and Ottoman periods. Um, but interestingly, when I was doing field work there in the late 90s, and I, I lived there often on for the 10 years after that, but when I was doing field work there in the late 90s, I heard about a guy that was writing his master's thesis on how to culturally rescue the people of Fatmeh and Darbul Ahmar from the influence of liberalizing culture and westernization and the power of West American corporations that were building these huge towers that he particularly hated in the Darbul Ahmar area and the Fatmeh area. And this was Muhammad Atta. Then, of course, we know that in 2001, Muhammad Atta led the attacks on the World Trade Center. What no one but me has been able to do is actually get a hold of his actual master's thesis that he wrote Amazing. about his plan to redevelop Batman Darbul Ahmar into not exactly a museum of Islamic architecture, but into a model for the gender segregated and class um, uh, reimagined structure of Cairo, which would be governed by a, a kind of um, group of select three or four pious tested families whose morality was unquestionable. They would rearrange the spaces in the city so that there would be cul-de-sac zones and then there would be free zones, the cul-de-sac zones. Women would dominate and be able to do certain kinds of market weaving and home-based manufacturing activities. In the, cur the open corridors, you would have men would have manufacturing and also be able to gauge in tourism and architectural tours and everything like that because this is still an incredibly rich architectural region. But to make sure that the men in the free corridors would not look down and lust after the women in the cul-de-sac economies, you would have to make sure to destroy all the tall buildings in those corridors that would look down at the cul-de-sac. He had a particular fetish with the problems of tall buildings looking down on people. So I do make this rather controversial speculation in this book that he writes about, because after that, he then went to work on Aleppo. And he did field work amongst people in Aleppo who were displaced during the urban redevelopment of where? Where can you guess? Where was little Aleppo? It was where they built the World Trade Center hmm. in New York. So he went to do field work in little Aleppo with people that had been displaced from little Aleppo, which is where they built the World Trade Center in the 1970s. So yeah, so this is kind of like the, the surprise in the book that, so, but the point is not just like, there's another completely different story of the whole war on terror era. If you see that part of this moral purification agenda, part of this attempt to restructure, to eliminate women's power from public space and economies, to re-house them into a lower rank in this cul-de-sac economy, which is being pursued by police actors by even humanitarian actors in this rescue agenda, which appears to be a secular humanitarian project, that it's perfectly, it bridges the gap between the set of supposedly new humanitarian actors and actually can work relatively well for these kind of new, um, you know, uh, extremist actors in, in this kind of high um, militarized way. So I analyzed, this is the actual report from UNDP, which I was a consultant for UNDP at this time in the 90s. So I have a copy of this report, but it was never published. It was, it was 
canceled and hidden. Mohammed Atta's dissertation was also stolen by his advisor from the library and hidden. Mm-hmm. Um, so it took a long time for me to get all these reports. But the point is, it's not just a kind of like wow thing, but to show that we can read the entire war on terror era differently if we see it in terms of the way it, that space, morality, gender, and militarization are played out, the way that the discourse of rescue, the discourse of protecting cultural authenticity from the perversions of the global, we can dismantle that and we can see the way that civil society movements at the, in their confrontation with police and military have often come so close to utterly transforming, dismantling, and reimagining what, it, what security is. And it's, but it's only at that moment when we've come so close time and time again in Brazil and in Egypt to completely dismantling the notion of the security state that it comes back with a revenge, with this new kind of humanitarian rescue discourse, this new kind of moral savior mission, and becomes even more violent than before. So, of course, I see, and, and in the book, I also always, like in every chapter, I focus on other movements in that area that have a completely different notion of how to solve this gender and um, cultural problem that are much more interesting, truly democratic and inclusive. So there's always, there's always a good, I always try to end in a, with a positive alternative. So we can talk about this if people have questions, I'm just, because uh, and I know some of you specifically have read my work on how the issue of sexual harassment and assault in this way became both a, a, a very important rallying call for feminists in, who were at the front, absolutely key to the uprisings in Egypt in 2011 and 12, but then how this was appropriated by the police and by Sisi himself as a tool, ironically again, to protect women out of existence, to, to, to encase them in a new policing agenda, to separate them from the revolution and to crush their capacity to speak for themselves as leaders of the nation or the of the revolution. So that's a, that's um, the whole culture of women resisting sexual harassment and resisting the appropriation of sexual harassment <laughs> politics by the police and military is of course um, a really important story and that battle continues to today. This whole popular culture of resistance to the military's appropriation of the protection of women which ends up becoming the political containment and eradication of women's voice. So we can talk a bit about that, but I just want to wrap up to make sure we have time to talk. I also have here lots of other slides about the new authoritarian government in Egypt and their policies around gays and AIDS and women and sex and children, because <laughs> that's a whole other set of <laughs> politics. But why not? Just, I'll end the talk there and hope we have a chance to, to explore these questions more. But the lesson, yeah, the lesson of of the book in general is that these attempts by police and military forces to penetrate the realm of culture and the social through these actually incredibly violent moral rescue missions only happens when they're at the verge of being overthrown by alternatives that have organized, that have, prevent, that have presented a different notion of security, a different notion of citizenship. So we shouldn't let our, allow ourselves to be in despair at those times like we have sometimes in Brazil and sometimes in Egypt in which we have incredible repression because that repression is coming only because those new alliances between Saudi capital, between military and different kind of moralist social movements are fragile. Those alliances are tenuous and they are repressive because they realize that the alternative is right at the horizon uh, and so we still can have some hope for change in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. You want to call on people? You want me to do it for you? Sure, which if you want to. Okay, okay. the floor is now open. Anyone? Uh, okay, and back, and then over to Suzanne. Go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Ramsey Salty. I meet you there. Thank you, Jim. Nice to see you. 16 years. And I'm delighted to be here, and I really enjoyed your talk. Because we've had many speakers come and speak about, you know, the Arab Spring and you know, liberalism and, and you know, post theory or whatever. But I really appreciated the fact that you zoomed in on 
the flight of marginalized sexuality within that context, uh, you know, mentioning the teen vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there's a movie that, that's been made about that called Who Long Movie Call of My Yeah. Uh, I, uh, if you're interested in the flight of marginalized sexuality, do check it out. It illustrates really both sides of the argument that Paul was, uh, was uh, talking about. And I was wondering, you know, I, you were making these connections between feminism mm. and what I would call queer theory or marginalized sexuality or uh -huh. sexuality. Uh, do you see uh, a future where these would be sort of allied together in order to get to a place that is better than their own? Or do you see the two as separate movements that need to develop on their own? That's a great question. So, yeah, feminist movements and then LGBT or sexual minority movements and how they can have a more powerful alliance. Well, that's why I use the term, you know, moralization, morality, politics, rather than identity politics or gender politics so much. Because I think, and I, I use morality politics specifically because it is a kind of interesting gray zone between religion and secularism, right? Which I think is always such a, a par paralyzing binary. So, you know, one can talk about, so the, what I worry about is this mix of policing and moralization, which I think can unite all kinds of actors, right? It can unite those that want to make sure that there's, that there's a space for diverse public sociabilities and sexualities. It can unite women that don't want a particular kind of patriarchal home or don't want to be excluded, locked in the cul-de-sacs or forced to return home or raped on the streets because they should be at home during political rallies which has become systematic. It has nothing to do with Egyptian tradition. Um, I've lived eight years in Egypt, and until the last couple of years, my friends and I could be anywhere in Cairo all night long. In I lived four and a half years in Balneo, which was the most violent neighborhood in the Middle East. And it's only violent when the police come in and kill people. It's not like violent, including for women and for queers, uh, on their own. This is manufactured. In just the last years, the sexual, systematic sexual assault of women is a particular political policy generated by these vigilante groups, sometimes picked up by the state, sometimes countered by the state, but always obsessed by the state, right? So I think this focus on vigilante moralism, whether in Brazil or whether you're in Santa Barbara, where nine of my students were shot by a moral vigilante, were assassinated last year. What? Because, you know that? Yeah, nine students were shot by a crazy guy who wanted to punish overly sexual women because they wouldn't sleep with him or whatever. Yeah, so this is a global problem, right? And I think it's best to not focus on the, the religious ideology, you know? ISIS is, is a big fat moral vigilante movement, right? We can, don't have to defend Islam or not, just change the subject. Like, this is a global trend, right? Toward this militarized kind of squads that implement violent, punitive, exterminate, exterminatory kinds of moves against cultural and sexual minorities. So this is not, does, it's a, it's a, it's a, it could be a huge coalition, and I, but I think we have to change the, sub, the subject from identity politics towards critique of the mix of vigilantism, moralism, and new forms of policing. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, so these that came over there, are they uh -huh. also working with the sex uh, industry or...? In, in, uh, okay, in Saudi Egypt? Yes. Oh, the Saudi and Kuwaiti Saudi, yeah. capital? Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that would be, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of how are they trying to close down the sex economy or are they just trying to take it over so that they profit? You know, I would say definitely it's the latter, right? But the whole point is that it has to be that the independence of people in the sex economy, and particularly women, you know, that's something that's always behind this, the repression in the sexual economy. Uh, paradoxically, it takes often takes the banner of feminism, you know, the eradication of sex work. But who it affects most when you do one of these police-led eradication campaigns, it affects women's businesses, not just brothels, but hair salons, women's tourism businesses, 
women that run their own businesses by a lot of these types of repressive authorities are seen already to be verging towards prostitution somehow if they're not controlled by their husbands or by men. So this is part of, there's bigger things going on behind these moral rescue campaigns. And often the elimination of women's advances in the economy is absolutely the result of this. The closure of all these brothels in Copacabana just last year before the World Cup. And again, study after study after study have been done that say that men going to the World Cup are there to watch men. They're there to watch people play soccer. Right? They're there to watch each other goof around around stadiums. They're not there to have these mass rape and prostitution campaigns. They just they do not do that. That's a complete myth. Actually, prostitution tends to drop because men are so busy paying attention to soccer. They actually are interested in soccer. So, but the closing down of those brothels in Copacabana during the World Cup ended up not just being closing down the brothels. The police also harassed all the hair salons, all the women's tourism companies, all the women who own apartments. They're renting out to tourists because it suspected them of being <coughs> prostitutes. It destroyed specifically women's ability to profit from the World Cup. So there is, I'm not, you know, I'm not a deconstructivist to the level that I think behind these, that these are just representations. There is, there is a real attack on certain people and communities going on here, and it's being masked. And there's an attack on this alternative that's on the verge of being implemented that would demilitarize the notion of security and put a gender critique at that center. But it's being repressed with incredible forms of violence. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, uh, it's interesting that you're comparing Brazil and Egypt. Yes. These are two very different political systems. Mm -hmm. One is uh, you know, been incredibly authoritarian and is even more incredibly authoritarian now mm -hmm. throughout the period of your study or any study virtually. Mm -hmm. The other has been a, at least a formal democracy mm -hmm. for about 30 years and one as we were talking about earlier with what seemed to be uh, quite a progressive political party leading it for the last 13 years. Mm -hmm. So at least, okay, I don't know how people mobilize out of this problem in Egypt in the current context. Mm -hmm. But in Brazil, it's formally a democracy. There's levels of freedom in civil society. Mm -hmm. So what would you define as a reform agenda that could be pushed by progressive parties or by civil society mm -hmm. in Brazil? Or what are Brazilians identifying as a reform agenda? Great. Yeah, this is, this is a really critical question because I've been... I was one of the wonderful things about Brazil and its open civil society, at least in the in the late '90s and early 2000s, was its was its openness to new ideas and its ability to produce all kinds of models. It's, to allow myself, when I had just arrived and my Portuguese was still not very good, I was able to participate in the governor's reform committees for the police and pathetically trying to train the military police to be sensitive to gender and sexual minorities, which is, which is where I learned a lot of the uh, limits of that t training approach to security sector reform. But I did, but Brazil's an incredible place to try out new ideas, to learn, um, and to see social movements at work pushing for change. Um, but basically, the, the PT has not been able to make the ruling debt. party, the, ruling party the Workers' Party, the party of President Lula and of President Dilma and of many of the governors um, throughout uh, it, that have generated some reform projects, but they have not been able to um, uh, to expand um, to a national scale with some of the successful models. The UPP, the police, the police <coughs> pacification police units, which are kind of like the Olympic or the World Cup police deployed in particular slum areas, have in some ways been on paper a very important success because they actually for a while act as police rather than as um, attack units that are just there to shoot traffickers. They actually provide s regularized forms of security. They actually eliminate the, the gun trafficking economy. They provide some link between the people and the state. They start allowing for properties to be registered um, and therefore sometimes immediately sold off and gentrified. But So there are models, UPP is, is now possibly already exhausting its um, its capacity and being taken over by the old 
corrupt elements um, in society. But anyway, what your question is about is, is first, the reason why they're interesting to compare is for some of the things we've been talking about in the other questions, is that I wanted to look at a place where I could examine questions of policing, militarization, and the moral dimensions of coercion without being stuck in the problem of Islam. Uh, every single thing written at that point in the Middle East that focuses on anything to do with gender or anything to do with uh, the moral constitution of civil society has to be framed around the problem of Islam. When I was living in Batnaya, there was no problem with Islam. The problem was with the police battles with narco-traffickers. The problem was with, with the constant attempt to torture my friends to turn them into informants. They would hang them in the telega, the refrigerator, in the basement, but, um, with their hands behind their back into their shoulders disintegrated. And this, they would do this once a month, starting at their 18th birthday, to all my friends until they would become police informants. So I looked for a place where they study these kind of practices, where they study the way these morality policing state from the ground up is militarized. And Brazil had amazing literature on it. It had amazing kind of social movements that thought about it in the way I did, and that didn't simplify the questions of the role of religion and morality in these processes. So that's been really rich for me. Now I can go back to Egypt and I can talk about morality and religiosity and charismatic religiosity in a way that's really complex, that doesn't divide up things into one category or the other. So the reform agenda, I think, the book points to in each chapter an alternative. And each of those is a security sector reform agenda because it pr it's produced out of these social movements that put these, the, the gender and moral questions at the center that focus on the, the need to demilitarize notions of security and to focus instead on social inclusion and redistribution mechanisms and to use that as a basic logic for then following through on building a, a more sustainable long-term security sector agenda. So the problem with security sector reform in the past 20 years is this focus on whether it's community policing or intelligence-led policing or on humanitarian intervention models of policing, which have actually given a, a kind of free pass to the same old police institutions to extend deeper into communities using still a coercive model of intervention. So I'm, the, my, my book is saying, well, community policing, humanitarian policing, morally cleansed police models are actually worse, not better, than the old police models. What we need is a notion of security that's not based on coercive policing, but it's based on social empowerment, and particularly on these this questions of gender, morality, and sexuality, not because women are more important or sexual minorities are more important, but because the masculinity dimension of militarism is so essential that if that's not deconstructed and addressed, especially when you marry it to moral supremacy and cultural rescue, and then marry that to militarized masculinity, it's unstoppable. So that gender dimension is essential to understand. Um, yeah. I want to thank you for this. I study the police bureaucracy in China. Oh. Um, I don't think they're quite as threatened as uh, the areas that you study, but, but I can see how this could become an issue, especially the way mm -hmm. that people's on police because they've developed it recently. But my question, uh, because I study the bureaucracy and I'm interested in these things, I want to know who's driving the, this reform of rescue missions. Is this coming from national leaders? Is it coming from police leaders? Mm. I want to get a sense of that when we talk about the really Who's pushing for this? use human security state type of type where's, of vision. Where is this coming from? Um, yeah. The ideology and also just the, the, the director. Right. So it, it works because it's an intersection. My book is annoying that it always has these Venn diagrams. Like, it, you know, these intersecting. For, but so what it, basically the reason why it works is it appropriates sincerely progressive trends within feminism within the progressive branches of charismatic religious movements, whether they're evangelical, Salafist, liberation, they all <coughs> And also some of the discourses of human rights about the need to have more community accountability, more humanitarian law approach, rather than an anti-communist Cold War type approach to these. So these, these forms of resistance and reform that are sincere and that are positive in their own, when police have learned, and that the book is about these learning processes, police have learned how to speak that language, the language of humanitarian intervention, the language of gender sensitivity, the language of, the, of moral rescue against the perversions of globalization, and they've, they've articulated those progressive languages 
with these new security doctrines that, that basically enable the worst elements of the dictatorship era police to re-enter the civil sphere using this language they've appropriated from these progressive movements, but implementing them in these incredibly coercive ways. So it's, you know, so in each case, the line of, you know, who is moving first and who is picking up the order and then it's not, there's not always one pattern, right? In the Operation Princess movement was, you had an, an evangelical movement that was linked to um, movements throughout the, around the world that had been talking about trafficking and stopping sex slavery and stopping sex trafficking. And it wasn't going anywhere for a while because Brazil has a strong sex workers' rights movement, has a very different set of feminist traditions. Anti-trafficking feminism was thought very much as part of the white slavery movement, which was very much an American ideology critiqued by many Brazilian feminists. But in my view, the reason why it suddenly picked up steam was because the police saw this as a way to redeem their mission and to give them some new way to become active in these very wealthy areas that had basically kicked out the military police. But now if they were allowed back in in order to purge the areas of sex trafficking, they'd have this new moralized mission. So in that case, it was a social movement appropriated by the police. And then when it started to come together, the president, Lula, for a while thought, OK, this is great. Finally, I'll be able to remake Brazil as a humanitarian, gender-sensitive superpower that is going to get rid of sex slavery instead of being the sambista, you know, mulata sex tourism um, object. But he, Lula himself, as well as many of the PT leaders, realized then later in the campaign that they had gone down the wrong path and they opened themselves up to more police violence. So these are some very savvy police leaders in other words. They're able to, to know these campaigns and then work them for their own advantage and, and then co opt the, the um, national. Level. Well, I think, you know how savvy they are. They're, well, police are, I think, when they're opportunistic, absolutely. I think one of the, you know, methodologically, because I actually work, you know, very close to particular police units in these operations, you see, yeah, police are not artifacts of the coercive state. Police institutions always have a relative autonomy, and there's usually, you know, three or four completely autonomous forms of police in each of these countries. They have relative autonomy, they have their own traditions, cultures, and practices, and they're always trying to find new ways to avoid accountability. So if they see, oh, great, you know, we have now, of course, the war on drugs, then the war on trafficking, and so those will be picked up in, a, in very nuanced ways, and of course they'll try to do it in a way that, that re-legitimizes them, especially during times of social unrest and resistance. Mm -hmm. My field is going to be about Thanks a lot for your information. Mm -hmm. uh, my associates uh, are divided. Uh -huh. Some believe that CC is God sent, mm -hmm. and some believe he is no more than a military dictator with this messianic posture. <laughs> so, what is Trying to get to good. Did you get the comment? Well, that's a funny picture. <laughs> there we go, CC and Putin. <laughs> okay. So, so I don't, of course, don't want to do any say anything too simplistic about Sisi, and I will be coming back to Egypt. So please let me back in the airport and don't arrest me. Um, talking to the camera. By the way, I was born in Egypt and I lived there for twenty years. Yes, you're from Skenderia. Yes, yes. No, no. I love Egypt, and I learned most of what I am saying today from my experiences in Brazil and Egypt. It's not that I Good luck went there to test. Yes, yes. Play this video if I'm arrested. I'm a cool guy. Uh, so, uh, so what I think we need to look on, we talk about Sisi. I think what um, the supporters who are not just corrupt crony capitalists and awful police authoritarians, the people, the real people that support him, I think are um, happy that the Egyptian state is going to have a project and a future, that it will produce something that in, in the discourse of authoritarian rule is a common future that's going to get stuff done, it, that Egypt will not be torn apart by um, 
by processes of globalization or internal dissidents, and it will actually have a future. Because of course, Egypt's been backsliding for most of its people. For a, a few in the, in the elites, Egypt's been becoming increasingly prosperous. But in these enclaves that very much look like the little gated cities of the Gulf, and which have no relationship to the rest of Egypt. But for most of Egypt, there's been a sense that the country is has no project for the future, has no project for its youth, has no project for development, has no even imagination about the future. So there's that authoritarian or fascist um, desire in a moment of crisis to have a project to believe in. But of course, Sisi's project that he offers is mostly a project of destroying the traitors, destroying the enemy within, destroying all forms of political association that would be the foundations of citizenship itself. He's been remaking the education curriculum in the schools and universities to focus on the love of the state and the love of the leader and actually dismantling and erasing the lessons about citizenship, <coughs> the, the proud history of Egyptians struggling to create a democracy, to create social rights, to create a new um, citizen identity for themselves. That's being dismantled and in its place is a, is a curriculum that's really quite scary in terms of its focus purely on uncritical adoration for the, the, the power structure itself. So I think, and part of what Sisi's genius is, is these are all, there's a whole other lecture from my new book about the way that new authoritarian desires and pleasures in Egypt are being triangulated through these um, the things that in the United States we, we recognize because they look a lot like a kind of crazy Fox News coverage of, of Obama or something. But these new discourses about Western imperialism that are very gendered and sexualized, that betray, that portray American power as uh, a form of um, aggressive femininity mixed with black predatory criminality. Ann Patterson, the in ambassador in Egypt, was attacked very much using these kind of terms, a portrayer as kind of a sex slave for Obama. Um, uh, we have this kind of sexual and racial portrayal, not just of the Brotherhood, but of all opposition in, in, in Egypt. We, of course, in Brazil, we have some of the same type of queer gendered portrayals of any attempt of Brazilian leaders to make some kind of connection with the more radical or the, the more, um, you know, Ahmadinejad. that's Ahmadinejad in the arms of Lula. And this is when President Morsi visited um, Jilma. <laughs> and of course, in Egypt and in Brazil, there are a lot of jokes about, again, this kind of, this kind of funny, both a critique of Jilma for being the wrong kind of aggressive woman and a critique of Morsi for being a kind of racialized, um, sexually awkward man. So of course, here, we have, there was all these jokes about Morsi and his very rather good-looking prime minister, Kandil, being kind of a queer couple or something. So we have Morsi saying he's going to give um, Kandil uh, these, these panties because he loves Smurfs. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, Jilma, basically, her husband has become this, like, little boy toy as he's portrayed. Anyway, so here's Jilma talking about uh, you know, where, where, where am I going to put this? You know, anyway, so, and looking like, like Morsi's being threatened by Jilma's phallus. Anyway, so there's a whole other funny sad set of um, portrayals of this transition between the Arab Spring via this moment of Morsi towards this new kind of logic. But uh, it still, had the understanding that the moral and sexuality dimensions are not just a matter of being attentive to gender, but are really, I think, essential to producing the support, the desire for CC, but also the fear and then accountability of, of the regime. What is implied by this picture? This is, you know, we now have um, Russia's building a, an entire um, free trade city along this, this so the, the triangle of Gulf capital, Egyptian military, and Russian strategic support is a, an entire global logic that we're going to have to understand and get used to. That 
with the money from the Gulf, the Suez Canal is now being rebuilt in the most loved project in Egypt. That's one of the reasons people say they love Sisi. He's building a new Suez Canal, which will be owned and operated by Dubai Ports, which is a private company, which is directly related to Dick Cheney through some strange things like everything. And Putin is building a free trade zone and city along this new canal. Um, they've also, Egypt is also going to be joining the Eurasian Common Market, which is like the, you know, kind of the losers EU, or it's, you no, know, it's basically the Russian sphere of influence focusing on energy pipelines, infrastructure, and military uh, contracting. Uh, and obviously they too share this particular kind of highly, bizarrely eroticized military thug masculinity which is uh, more than a coincidence because they both use similar uh, modes of legitimation. They both have an obsession with restoring certain kinds of gender and sexual norms. And that's always at the forefront of the way they describe the transformation of society. But their projects on the ground are big infrastructure, big energy, big canals and free trade zones now. And so their model is, is a global model that we need to pay attention to. Yeah. Do we have time? Last question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, Paul, I'm interested in learning about the second part of your argument. And mm -hmm. because you have been, you know, the religion because you have been writing about yeah. liberalism. And I wonder where you talk, I mean, what is the evidence for the end of it? Right. And uh, also perhaps related to that is like, I'm interested in your metaphor of, of Archipelago. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, so how does, I mean, you're talking about these islands of security, mm -hmm. but what about the other islands? And do we, are there islands that we see economic distribution and other public policies? Mm -hmm. How are they related? I'm asking this question because my research is on Turkey, yeah. and uh, the securitization trend that you're talking about is in a way very applicable there. But there's also like this aspect of economic distribution. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering how they are related. And it perhaps was the use of that metaphor for us right. in explaining this. Well, those are huge questions, totally uh, relevant. So I'll try to address them as briefly as possible. We can keep talking about it. But so the question of neoliberalism, I am, it's a kind of teaser or bait and switch title, the end of neoliberalism. I'm talking about the end of neoliberalism in two ways. One, mostly I'm talking about the end of neoliberalism as an epistemological issue that I think whether if you're a neoclassical economist or if you're a leftist that's critiquing the World Bank and financialization of the world, that the, the critique or the ideology of neoliberalism both tends to turn the world into one monolith, uh, into one timeline of misdevelopment, it tends to put the global north and finance capital into a position of total power over the, the global timeline. Um, and it also tends to put issues like violence, coercion, policing, gender as tertiary issues that are secondary or tertiary effects of the redistribution of the, the inequalities produced by neoliberalism. So for me, in a tradition I trace back to um, you know Stuart Hall, to Foucault, to a group to many uh, you know Gib Gibson Graham and others that have analyzed capitalism differently, that I tend to think that these practices of recreating spaces and bodies and embodying new moralities of the subject are the real story. And they're always contingent. And they're always different, but yet forming patterns that then transfer in particular ways through these particular ideological processes. And then capitalism is a secondary effect of those embodiment, security, and morality logics. So there's no one story of capitalism. There's no one story of neoliberalism. There are many related, contingent, intersecting stories of the production of bodies, space, and moralities. And then this thing we call capitalism or neoliberalism is an effect which we should never think of as monolithic of those primary forces on the ground. So that's the epistemological critique of neoliberalism. The, the Sometimes I come in the book talking about the end of neoliberalism, meaning that we are now in an era like C.C. Putin, where we have uh, kind of economic regimes that have nothing to do with the free market, even if even in the free trade zones, like as they call them, they're about huge contracting operations and mega projects controlled by a very small 
oligarchical mix of a handful of contracting corporations and their military partners. This is why it's so violent and exclusionary. There's no attempt to produce a market at all. There's no attempt to produce a citizenry that identify as consumer consumers and can make demands about upon the market by choice and innovation and creativity. That's a very elite discourse which the Bay Area can still produce in the very, very tip top of the economy, a notion of innovation and creativity and choice. But in these oligarchical spaces where you have oil contractors and the barons of these big mega projects, whether they're soccer stadiums, etc., working indirectly with military leaders to implement their policies, there's nothing liberal or neoliberal about that. So that requires, that's not not saying I don't sympathize with the critiques of financialization and the global crisis all around that, but that we need to understand political economy of oligarchical military oil, uh, not according to neoliberal <coughs> notions. The other question you have is very big, so maybe we can talk about that afterwards, but you're right. This is not, this, as, as I just said in the other bit, that my, I'm not trying to say that these laboratories are the world. I'm saying that this is because I'm looking at such different places. This is a most dissimilar case study. This is not a most similar case study. I found remarkably similar patterns in remarkably distinct kinds of spaces. So it allows me to therefore make a global argument, but that is not predictive in any rigorous sense, but it's an explanatory set of concepts that's taken from case studies which no under which seemingly should not speak to each other, but that speak to each other very well. So that doesn't say that, that in Turkey you're going to find a, a, a much a different set of conditions that resonate a bit, but that might take us in a, in a different direction. And I hope that is true, that there are much more progressive places to look or that there are other variables that I don't consider. But the point here is, is to produce new concepts and new lenses for seeing rather than to produce a predictive um, explanation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, before we close, I want to thank uh, the Mediterranean Studies Program on campus for their partnership once again with our seminar uh, in this series. And uh, please join me in thanking Paul for a stimulating presentation. Why is Nan Olak a spin? Matahod Lak Habit Vaslin Hotto Hagar Hetari Tibarat Naru Titfi Wianair Hanait Fi Wib Atala Wer Osfi Wib Atala Wer Osfi يمكن في الأيام الجاية هنعمل لك مولد وهدية تلعب في بومسا 